But we had a wonderful time in North Carolina with our kids and our grandkids. And I just want to say thank you for praying for us. One of those mornings, last Wednesday morning, I got to spend by myself with my seven-year-old grandson, Isaac. Um, we got to do some fun things together. We went out to breakfast together. And we talked about a lot of things. If you know Isaac at all, you know I did most of the listening. <laughs> and he, because there's something about little grandkids. Jeff and I were talking about this this morning. They all have very, very important stuff that they need to tell you right now. Um, and we did a lot of that. But one of the things that we talked about, and I intentionally did this, I wanted to talk to him about the word trustworthy. And I asked him as we were on our way to breakfast about that word. I said, you know what the word trustworthy, you know what that means? And we talked about what it meant and how important that word is and how important that word is in a family and what that quality of trustworthy does for a relationship, any relationship. That's a pretty good grandpa discussion, don't you think? Amidst all the other ones that we talked about, like Thunderbirds and, and all kinds of things that I don't know about. <laughs> Trustworthy. Trustworthy is proving, showing over and over and over that you can be trusted. How many of you think that's a pretty important component for a relationship? It's probably, if not the most important, it's right up there. Any relationship, the relationship between you and a business, you want them to be trustworthy. The relationship between you and your family, every direction, especially your spouse, you want them to be trustworthy. It's important and absolutely essential in our relationship with God, too. And that's what God's been doing. He's been doing it over and over and over since before the foundation of the earth. Every time he speaks, every time he acts, he proves and demonstrates that he is trustworthy. His word is trustworthy. He's not doing it because he, he's uh, intentionally uh, trying to create a show to, to prove something. He is just trustworthy because he's trustworthy. He can't be anything else. That's who he is. That's his nature. Everything he does shows that he can be trusted. And any honest interaction with him and his word on our part will show that he's 100% trustworthy, but we still have a hard time trusting him, don't we? That's not his fault. He's never done anything to, to show that, that he would be anything other than trustworthy, but we struggle. We have trust issues with a lot of people, but especially with God. I want to begin a, a new sermon series this morning called Trusting God. I didn't think about it until I, just as I was saying that coming out of my mouth, it follows the series we did about the hallmark of discipleship being love and that the, the way that we grow in that is to grasp how high and how wide and how long and how deep is the love of God that makes us love. The same, the same thing is true about trust. In fact, there's a, there's a unique relationship between trust and love. I've heard it said that you can measure the quality of love. You know, we measure things in inches and feet or pounds and ounces. How do you measure love? You measure it in the depth of trust. The depth of trust. But the way we grow in our love is to grasp how wide and how long and how, how high and how deep the love of God is. When we begin to grasp how trustworthy it is, it causes us to grow in our trust and to become trustworthy back to Him. He can trust us with stuff because we trust Him. Of course, this morning, as we think about Fourth of July, we think about our national motto, In God We Trust, which is is a little hollow now on a national level. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today. But what about you and me? What about us? On your personal level, on my personal level, do I trust God? Do we trust God? If you've hung around Jeff Linville at all for more than about 10 minutes, you've probably heard him say at one time or another, well, either I trust God or I don't. Anybody ever hear him say that? I love that question. It's a great self-examining question. It's a great question to ask yourself when you're trying to decide what to do, which way to jump on something. 
Do I trust God or not? When you're trying to decide what to give weight to, when I'm making a decision, what do I give weight to? Do I give weight to what this guy says or do I give weight to what this is? What do I get? Well, do I trust God and his word? How much weight do I give that in my life? What's it going to be? Either I trust him or I don't. Because typically, if you ask that question, you'll come up with an answer. If I truly trust God, this will be my action. This will be my response. If you think about a series on trusting God, probably the first verse that popped into your mind, one that you're familiar with, is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I didn't call Deanna in the middle of the week to tell her to put this on the front of the bulletin, but that from, from the rest of the series, this will be on the front of the bulletin. You know it. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him and He will make your path straight. And maybe you learned it in King James. Uh, I had him put it up there in King James. The first phrase is the same as that last phrase that's a little different in King James. It says, trust the Lord with all thine heart, all your heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. The other one was submit to him. Both of those are a pretty accurate reflection and translation of the Hebrew because when you acknowledge him, you submit to him and he will direct thy paths or make thy paths straight. We just came off of a big long road trip, 1100 miles, and not everywhere in America has roads like Kansas that are straight. Um, there's a lot of roads that are, are up and down hills, and they even while they're going up and down hills and mountains, they have curves and switchbacks, and you can't see what's down the road. So when it says he will direct your paths, he will make your paths straight, it means he will show you what you need to know for what's ahead. Anybody want that? Because you see, this is a command and a promise, and it's both. It's not just a command and a promise. It's a command with a promise. If, even if the promise wasn't there, it'd still be a command. The first three lines are commands. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. That's what we should do. That's the, the, the direction to us. But there's a promise attached. He will make your path straight. He will direct your paths. The one we read earlier from Psalms 37, um, after the offering, was very similar. Similar in structure and in content. Trust in the Lord and do good. That's a command. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord. Those are all commands. Here's the promise. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Then here's another command and a promise. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. Here's what he will do. He will make your righteousness reward. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn and your vindication like the noonday sun. This is an interesting one, um, if you're familiar with Psalms 37, because this is given as a contrast to a different kind of behavior, a different kind of attitude. Anybody know what the first two words of Psalms 37 are? Don't look. Fret not. Do not fret. Do not fret. So the, the two things that are contrasted are this attitude of fretting and the attitude of trusting the Lord. And those two attitudes will lead to two different behaviors in us. Do not fret. And he doesn't even just say, do not fret because there's nothing to fret about. Wouldn't that be good? He says, do not fret even when all these things to fret about are happening. Do not fret when evil men... And he doesn't even stop with that. He says, do not fret when evil men succeed in their schemes. Instead, trust in the Lord. And do good. He doesn't say there's nothing to fret about. Quite the opposite. He says when there's things to fret about. When there are real impacting things in your life. When you get a call that says your niece has got a tennis ball sized tumor in the middle of her brain. That's that's a real deal. That's a real thing. He says do not fret. Trust in the Lord. Sounds illogical, doesn't it? And Psalms 37 sounds illogical too. When it says, do not fret when evil men succeed. You think, well, uh, of all the times to be fretting, of all the times to be worried, it would be when evil men are succeeding. He says, don't fret then. Why? Because there's an added feature that he talks about. And that feature is the future. 
He says, don't fret because you, you don't see around the curve, but I do. I know what lies ahead. The future, do not fret because it ain't over yet. Turn to your neighbor and say, it ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. I, I, I abbreviated that on my notes here with four uh, capital letters. I-A-O-V. I-A-O-V. And I realized those are in the Greek alphabet. I could get me a sweatshirt and put I-A-O-V on. People think I was a part of a fraternity. <laughs> oh, what fraternity do you belong to? It ain't over yet. That's the one. <laughs> the trustworthiness of God will always be in a question in your mind if you look in the short term. We, we've got to think in the long term. In the long term, God's trustworthiness is always vindicated. And that's important. Because until we get a hold of that, we will always struggle with trusting God. And that struggle with trust will weaken our relationship with Him. It'll take away from God something that He desires. Did you know that God desires for you to trust Him? Say, what what gift could I give God? You could give God the gift of your trust. He wants you to trust Him. When He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, what does that look like? It looks like trusting Him. If we don't trust Him, we take that away from Him. And if we don't trust Him, we miss out on something that He wants to give us. He wants to give us peace and he wants to give us joy. And that comes when we trust him. We desperately need it. We sang it just a minute ago. I'm desperate for you. If we if we judge the trustworthiness of God by present circumstances, we'll have trouble trusting him. But even in the midst of the hard things, he gives us things to hang on to. Amen. Amen. He gives us something to anchor into. And one of the things he gives us is he tells us in advance, you're going to have hard times. You're going to have trouble. In fact, the very reason that the world points to and says, well, your God is untrustworthy. What do they point to? Well, if your God was, if you could trust your God, you wouldn't have trouble. Because God is allowing trouble in your life, he's untrustworthy. God turns that around and he says, no, I'm going to tell you in advance, you're going to have trouble, so that when it comes, you can say, God knew that this was going to happen. Right? Jesus did that specifically with his disciples on the night of the, night of the Last Supper. Um, and you remember that long red letter section there in the midst of John? It, John 14, 1 starts out with, let not your hearts be troubled. What does that sound like? Do not fret. Don't worry. Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust. You believe in God. Trust. Believe also in me. That's where he says, don't let this happen to you. Instead of that, you need to do something else. Believe. You need to trust. And then he begins to tell them what's coming. And what's coming is not pleasant. It's not fun. He begins to tell them in chapter 14 and 15 and 16 stuff that's going to happen. I I, I had him uh, put up some of the stuff out of 15 here. It says, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Isn't that funny that he would say, let not your heart be troubled, but people are going to hate you. What else did he tell them? Go on here to the next one. A uh, servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. <laughs> if they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. This is John 16. I have told you this so that you will not fall away. I'm, t- I'm telling you this so that you will not lose trust. I'm telling you that bad things are going to happen so that you won't lose trust. Because if I didn't tell you when they happen, you might be tempted to believe what the world says. And the world's going to say, because this is happening, you can't trust God. I'm telling you this so that you will not fall away. They'll put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this. So that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. He wraps all this up at the end of chapter 
16 with 16.33. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You can trust in me because I'm, I know what's coming. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When we're in the midst of trouble, it appears, it seems, it feels like God's not trustworthy. But that's, if you, if you, if that's what drives you, you know what we're doing? We're leaning on our own understanding, which he told us not to do. Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. It seems like it, it looks like it, it feels like it, that's my own understanding. So how do we know? How do we know that God is trustworthy when it looks like it and it seems like it and it feels like that he's not? This is how we know. Romans 8, 18. Well, that's the wrong one. Take that down. What did he say? This is how we know. Here's what he said. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his only son, but graciously gave him up for us. How will he not also graciously give us every good thing? That's how we know. Because God gave his only begotten son. That settles it. That settles the issue of his trustworthiness. If he did not withhold his only son from us, we can trust him, amen? That's what Jesus told his disciples right after... um, let not your heart be troubled. What was his next line? I go to prepare a place for you. You see, if we get caught up in the short view, we will struggle with trust. We have to take the long view. How many of you know there's a, there's a couple of Texans in here today? I know there's a couple of Texans in here today. There's a town in Texas called Longview. Did you know that? There's a college there. Patrick actually went there uh, for a few years. Longview, Texas. I like that. I think, spiritually speaking, we all need to move to Longview. Because we've got to take the long view if we're going to trust God. What do I mean by that? We've got to take two long views. First of all, we start with this long view. We take a long view back to the cross, and that's where we look. And we say, God did not spare his only son, but he gave him up for us. Therefore, so we look back to that one. And then what do we look ahead to? Long view. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am... There ye may be also, right? We look, we look back to the cross and we look ahead to the second coming and if we take that long view, we can trust God. But in the middle of that, between those two events, that, that, that spans all the trouble and all the hardship and all the persecution and all the present suffering, right? Where we're tempted not to trust. Where we have to trust. How many know what the word stipulate means? Right? That's when you're, when you're doing sheetrock and there's these, these holes in the wall and you go around and you stipulate them. That's not what I mean. That's spackle. Stipulate, stipulates in a, in a trial, in a legal term, right? Where um, the, the, the prosecutor is trying to make a case and he's going to make a case that the defendant was at the crime scene, let's say. And so he brings all this evidence. Well, we have his DNA, we have his blood, we have this eyewitness. And eventually, the, the, they have so much evidence that the defense says, all right, we'll stipulate he was there. It's just a given. We're not going to fight it anymore. We're just going to stipulate that that's true. You don't have to, you don't have to prove it to me anymore. Can we just stipulate that God is trustworthy? We can stipulate that because of the cross. That's prima facie evidence. Prima facie evidence is evidence that cannot be disputed. God loves us because of the cross. That will never change. God's trustworthy because of the cross. That will never change. If you're a believer, if you're a believer in Christ, if you're a Christian, you believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. And that's where we say God is trustworthy. Regardless of what's going on in my life right now, that's true. He is. But in our flesh, we have a hard time trusting Him. We fret. And we lean on our own understanding. We lean on our intellect. 
that looks at a situation and says, this, there's, there's absolutely no good that could come out of this, even though we know God has said, I'm going to cause all things to work together for good. We lean on our feelings. It says, this hurts. And I don't like it. And sometimes in our pain, we accuse God. And we say, you're not trustworthy. You're not deserving of my trust. I'm not going to give you my trust. When I was about 12 years old, Dad and I and my brother had gone up to the pasture to check cattle one day. And in the ditch, there was a little puppy. And he was all full of briars. And, of course, you know what happened. He came home with us. He kind of looked like a schnauzer in the face, but he was about 57 different breeds, and his, his name was Mutt. <laughs> and Mutt was our dog for all my high school years, and he was a good dog, and he got in a lot of trouble. And one time he got a mouthful of porcupine quills, and we didn't go to the vet. I'm not saying anything about anybody that's present, but they don't like to spend money. We didn't go to the vet, and we pulled those porcupine quills out of his mouth with a pair of needle nose pliers. And me and my brother held him, and my dad pulled him out. And I want to tell you, that dog trusted us in a way that I don't think I could have. But after Des and I were married, and he was old, I was at the farm, and the fuel delivery truck came. Just preparing you, this is a sad story. <laughs> The fuel delivery truck came and parked and was putting fuel in the barrels and old Mutt saw a shady spot under the truck and he curled up in front of the back tires. And when the fuel delivery man left, it ran over his pelvis and his back legs and crushed him. And I loved that dog. And I went to try to help him and you know what he did? He bit me. He bit me hard. You know what? I wasn't mad at him. Didn't keep me from loving him. I wasn't mad at him because you know why I understood why he bit me. He bit me out of his pain. And he bit me out of his lack of understanding. And maybe he blamed me, I don't know, but he was hurting. And sometimes we do that to God. Sometimes stuff comes into our life and it hurts so bad that we just put it on God. He didn't cause it. But even our anger at God does not make God stop loving us. In fact, the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So when we're stipulating the trustworthiness of God, we also can stipulate the fact that he loves us unconditionally. How do we know that? Same reason. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So what we want to do is we want to begin to let this truth work on us. Because it's not our, our trust problem, it's not God's problem. He's trustworthy. Our trust problem is us, me. We've got to learn and begin to learn and continue to learn how to trust the Lord with all our heart, which includes acknowledging Him, acknowledging His sovereignty in all our ways. That's what trusting looks like. Acknowledging his purpose, his control, his kingdom. So as I was chewing on this idea about this sermon series, I began to think about, well, how, how's that going to play out? And I thought, I want to begin to look at some people in Scripture that trusted God. And as I began to think about that, it became quickly evident to me that that's exactly who God always chooses and uses are people who trust Him. There's a lot of a lot of differences. He uses all different kinds, all different places, times, genders, uh, educational levels, backgrounds. But the thing that they have in common is they trust God, and they're not perfect. They don't trust Him all the time, but they trust Him. And when they trust Him, He trusts them, and He entrusts them with something to do. And almost every time you see in Scripture somebody trusting God, you'll see something else. You'll see that God asked them to go against the grain. 
God trusts them with something that causes them to be in opposition to the culture they're living in. Not that just being going against the grain is always a sign of trusting God. People go against the grain for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's just flat out rebellion. And there's a lot of stuff in our culture that uh, trumpets and exalts going against the grain. But, th- but they're talking about a different kind of going against the grain. They're talking about basically rebellion. What I'm talking about is not rebellion. I'm talking about following God. Following God, trusting God, obeying God, which is what you do when you trust Him. Following God will put you in opposition with the society you live in, within opposition to the world. Why is that? Because the world is not following God. Amen? We're not to be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And when we when we trust the Lord... We obey the Lord. Well, what did Jesus say? If you love me, obey me. So the first person that I want to look at, and I want to start with him today, is Noah. A guy who trusted God. And if you look at the story of Noah, you'll open your Bibles to Genesis 6, and you'll begin to read what it looked like on the earth when Noah was there, and it was pretty bleak. Jesus said, by the way, in Matthew 24, that as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the day day that Jesus returns. So all this bleak stuff that's going on right now, as far as evil in the world, trust the Lord. He told us in advance. But in Noah's day, God looked and the whole world was full of violence and the whole world was full of evil. And God said, My spirit will not contain with man forever. His days shall be 120 years. And I've always wondered about that scripture because obviously God wasn't setting a a lifespan for man when he said 120 years. Because Noah was 600 when the flood came and he lived 350 years after that. So he wasn't setting a lifespan for man. Um, In fact, when God did talk about lifespan later, he he talked about three score and ten more sometimes. So what's that 120 years? The 120 years was when God started the clock on the flood. When God said this in Genesis 6, he meant that there was going to be, for 120 years from now, the flood's coming. And then a little bit later in that chapter, he told Noah something. He said, Noah, I'm going to destroy man, and I want you to build an ark. And you and your three sons and their wives and your wife are going to get in it. So you could almost deduce from that And when God said that, his sons were around and his sons were married. Because he talked about it. God could have been prophesying, but he probably told him that your sons and their wives, so they were probably around. If you do the math, if you do all the the genealogical stuff, you do the math, you'll find out that... By the way, I know I'm I'm just rambling here, but go with me. Who are Noah's three sons? Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? So who do you think is the oldest? Well, you think Shem's the oldest... Ham's second, Japheth. That's not the way it was. If you look at the numbers, Japheth is actually the oldest. Shem is second. Ham is the youngest. Why is Shem always first? Because from Shem came Christ, the Shemites, the Semites, the Jewish people. So he's listed first because of importance. But anyway, I said all that to say, after the flood, it says, when uh, one of them was 100 years old, two years after the flood. So that tells you that the middle one was born 98 years before the flood. So if you do a little figuring, by the time he was old enough to get married, just in just somewhere around, let's give it two bookends, somewhere around 50 to 120 years was the time that Noah was building the ark. A lot of people say 100 years. At least probably about the lifespan of a man today. That's how long he was building the ark. However many years that was, I want you to think about what was going on in Noah's life as he was trusting God? As he was trusting God, he was actively doing something that was counterculture. He was building an ark, and everybody that came along ridiculed him, made fun of him. As far as we know, and there's a lot of scientific evidence that shows this, when, when God talks about the canopy and the all that, the... Uh, Firmament. It may not have rained before the rain that came when, when Noah. 
It may, there may have just been a heavy dew every day, and that's what watered the earth. There was no experience on the earth of a flood. Certainly not a worldwide flood. And so Noah was telling them, judgment is coming. God's going to send judgment upon the earth. I have the means of salvation. Here it is right here. That's not a popular message. Not a popular message. But he trusted the Lord. Now, did it cost him to trust the Lord? Yeah. People thought he was a nut. People thought he was crazy. People probably hated him. They hated him because what he stood for, his whole life stood for, was was that there is a God and that he's holding us accountable. There is right and there is wrong and here's salvation. He was a preacher of the gospel and I'm sure he was hated. It cost him. But how many of you would say that if you asked Noah today, was it worth it to trust God? He would say yes. In fact, I don't think you'd even have to wait till today. If you, <laughs> I think about day two of the flood. Maybe day hour one of the flood. He would have said it was worth it to trust God. Because in trusting God, there's salvation. In trusting God, my family has found salvation. I think about Noah, I think about another guy who trusted the Lord, John the Baptist, who obeyed God. Because, you know, as you read that narrative of Noah, about three places it said, and Noah did exactly what the Lord told him to do. It wasn't easy being John the Baptist. Not get married. Not have a job. Live in the wilderness. Wear camel skins. Eat grasshoppers. Preach a message that everybody's going to hate you. Get your head cut off for confronting the king. That's not it. But yet the Lord called him. There's not been a greater prophet. If you ask John the Baptist today, was it worth it? I can tell you 100% he would say it was worth it. Jesus told his disciples, there's a day coming when, when men will kill you and they'll think they're doing God a service. Guess what? That happened to every single one of them. And they would say today, it was worth it to trust God. Will it cost you something? Yes. But what's our other option? Our other option is not trusting God. Back to Jeff's question. Either I trust him or I don't. Our other option is not trusting God. When we don't trust God, we lean on our, under, lean on our own understanding. Sometimes, for a short while, there's a season where that works. And we can even have comfort in that. But that doesn't last. You know, Esau liked his bowl of stew while he was eating it. But afterwards, he cried bitter tears because of the deal that he made. And when we lean on our own understanding and don't trust God, that's exactly what we do. Is trusting God worth it? Yes. Is it without hardship? No. In fact, Jesus guarantees it. Paul guarantees it in his letter to Timothy. All those who seek to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's not without hardship. But it's worth it. How do we know? We take the long view. We look back to the cross. We look ahead to the second coming. We stand on God's word because it's trustworthy and he's promised us because our hope is in the Lord, anchored in the Lord. Our strength is in the Lord. Our life is in the Lord. And because we know, we are convinced, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, nor the present. Whatever that present is. Nor the future, nor any power, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God. That's in Christ Jesus. That's where we rest. Would you stand with me?
Lord, we want to trust you more. We're thankful for, for commands with a promise. We're thankful for a command that says, trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. If we acknowledge you, Lord, in all our ways, you will make our path straight. You will straighten out the curve. You will direct our paths. It's something we pray, Lord, to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Lord. And we pray, Lord, to trust you in the midst of hard things, in the midst of pain, to trust you. And I pray, Lord, that you'll settle that in our hearts and that you will take truth and work on our trust with your truth. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.